Uh, well, Jose Sanchez, uh, it's so nice to meet you. My name is Martin Jansons. I am an MRC1 student here at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and this is part of the Goldsmith interview series where uh, before your lecture at the UTSOA as part of the, um, the lecture series here, I just get to ask you some questions more informally. Um, so, so Jose Sanchez, thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's a pleasure to meet you, Martin. Um, well, uh, you, you have a, a variety of, of work, uh, a ways to categorize your, your works. Um, so uh, Kibwe Tavares was here last year, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he sort of uh, launched into a different sort of career trajectory in terms of filmmaking and animation. And I think there's a similar sort of uh, idea with your work where you're launching into things like video games. Um, and I'll ask you the same question I asked him last week, which was, how do you describe yourself to people when you're talking about your profession? Like, what sort of title do you give to yourself? Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so I, I have been, you know, connecting my research in architecture with video games. Uh, but I would certainly describe myself as an architect. I, I'd certainly been operating using the medium of video games in many ways. Um, but I'm very interested in the speculation of what are the mediums for architecture, right? And I think that uh, as architecture has, you know, research and, and develop a great amount of work in computation, in many different domains, um, video games as a real time technology, as a technology that is providing kind of a, a very quick feedback loop between computation and a human um, interlocutor in a way. Uh, it's a very interesting piece of technology to look at from the perspective of architecture. So I, I do describe myself as an architect. I, I had an architecture education and I still teach from within an architecture school. So um, in many ways, the, the medium of games, it's meant to uh, democratize the practice of architecture, to reach construction through, through different ways, but it's certainly, it's, it's certainly focused on the practice of architecture itself. Yeah. Um... Do you think that there are more parallels between video games and architecture than sort of people's gut reactions uh, um, have them to, to understand? I guess my question is more about the audience that you're trying to, to reach. Are, are you trying to reach a, a, a broader audi audience with something like video games? Um, or are you, are you still trying to, to just find ways to visualize and communicate with, with the same sort of umbrella of, of architects that, that we're sort of used to considering? Right. No, it's certainly, I'm certainly trying to, to uh, expand the reach of architecture to a different audience, right? I, I do describe my work as, as trying to establish a dialogue with like non-expert users. So I, I certainly embed my work into what could be considered infrastructure for DIY. If you start looking at, you know, um, catalogs of things like the whole earth catalog back in the day, um, there's an, there was an attempt from to kind of, you know, share uh, recipes or ideas of architecture and design and farming and you know all sorts of different uh, attitudes towards living in a way uh, through a medium of a catalog and in many ways i think that uh, our current audience the, the kind of the 21st century uh, public in many ways uh, gravitates strongly to things like video games and it's it's a, it's a medium that certainly has um, a very strong following um, and a very strong audience and, and one that is very uh, literate to engage with complex systems, with systems, with design and, and user generated content. How do you kind of create intelligence out of, out of a collective enterprise, right? By sharing recipes and knowledge through forums and so on. So I, I'm, I'm excited to engage that, um, that spectrum uh, and understand how collective intelligence can emerge uh, using the medium of video games and how those tools kind of become available or offer themselves as opportunities or different opportunities for, for an already um, very well established audience. Did you, did you see these sort of, uh, you know, I don't necessarily want to call them exterior, but maybe more external from architecture tools like video games as a way to expand your agency as an architect? Did you feel like you were stifled with the sort of, um, uh, education maybe that you received originally or, or was it something that was really encouraged that you approach these different um, uh, uh, softwares and, and means of representation? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I, I, I kind of follow precisely what you're asking here, but like in many ways, I've, I've always been interested on in looking at different representation mediums. And in many ways, I 
my interest in games does not necessarily uh, focuses on the representational aspects. In many ways, it's a trade-off. Some of the representational um, interests had to be uh, constrained by in embarking into real-time technologies. In many ways, I remember when I was, I moved away from producing content that you could, I don't know, render or draw for many hours or days, you know, before actually putting in the page or, you know, in a publication to, to something that needs to be real-time and it's actually operating a, where a player can actually grab a screenshot from any different angle. There's kind of, um, there's many layers of control and many layers of a compromise in a way that come by embarking in this the research with this technology. Uh, but it make, it, the, the, that opens also a door to a different series of questions that could be addressed by, um, by the technology itself, right? Like, as I mentioned before, the idea of uh, collectivities, right? Like how do you engage an audience? First of all, how do you get a, a feedback loop between a computational system and a, and a public? And, and what is the kind of emerging discourse that appears from, from that interaction? So certainly um, video game aesthetics are interesting in their own right, I think. And, and there's people that have been focusing on video games as a means of representation, but in many ways I, I'm much more interested on, on them as platforms. And I think I'm gonna be discussing that today in the lecture. Do you think, um, do you think then like uh, institutionalized pedagogies, like I'm talking, I'm talking about university education for things like, uh, you know, masters of architecture, even undergraduate architecture programs, um, are they sort of embracing those different modes of representation or are you sort of at the, the forefront of pushing those, those boundaries in your own sort of pedagogies and, and classes that you teach? I think that the, the culture of representation in, in, in schools it's incredibly strong. And I think that it's very opportunistic. We see people grabbing tools, mixing tools from many different packages, gravitating to new tools that are start, starting to emerge. I think the real-time technology is starting to play an interesting role. Um, I'm not a big fan of some kind of packages, you know, that, that give you a, a very cooked result in a way that there's very little experimentation. Mm -hmm. I always encourage students to uh, to dig a little bit deeper, I personally work with Unity and I've seen a lot of great friends and, and colleagues that are working with Unreal and things like that that give you a lot of customization um, as opposed to really getting a, something that is already pretty uh, fixed as a, as a result. Um, but I think that the, the opportunism of, that we see in, in, in architecture, in, in no, no way I do think that I, I'm kind of just offering something radically new, I think that there is always kind of a contribution and, and a series of uh, angles that are uh, constantly pushing each other. So I'm, I'm constantly learning from the fantastic work that my colleagues do in, in um, using these tools in different ways as well. Yeah, well, on the topic of learning then, um, you know, plethora project in the sort of manifesto on the website, right, the description of itself, um, you talk about this, this idea of digital literacy um, that there are so many technical skills out there for architects, including those digital. Um, can, can you expand a bit by what you mean for architects to be digitally literate? Right. So I actually started the Plaster project around 2011, and it was basically a, a YouTube and Vimeo series of uh, tutorials where I was teaching programming. I remember I was learning programming um, in the programming language of processing and Java. And I found that there was uh, lots of resources, some like many of them online, but not, not enough of them. Uh, and I felt like I was learning that material and I wanted to also contribute to that community. Um, so, so some of those uh, words were written a long time ago, trying to expand uh, literacy to different kind of uh, mediums, different tools. Uh, and in a way felt like I was contributing to something that was already out there that was already being offered by, by a large community of people. Uh, Really online, and in many ways, the, the the work that I've started to do with video games uh, took over my my practice of developing YouTube tutorials or video content. Uh, as I do see that a video game um, takes a lot of agency in education as well, right? It, it does. Uh, we spend a lot of time with my studio developing what is the progression, what is the um, tutorial, what is the way in which a player kind of gets on board and understands certain concepts and start engaging with more and more complex ideas. So um, I've kind of been able to 
integrate some of those kind of uh, teaching in like uh, the teaching interests that I also had obviously in my, in my academic career into the, the work of research and, and work that I do with video games. Um, but I'm also a big fan of just online learning and, and, and always suggest that expanding on, on, on different areas of learning, it's always useful from representation to, to many different areas that, that I think that uh, we can always, you know, uh, continue that process, right? Yeah, actually, it's um, it's it's sort of uh, I don't want to say fate that that we eventually get to to talking here, but I uh, just wrapped up my thesis last semester and I focused on um, architecture software tutorials and and trying to understand how innocuous or not they are, um, understanding the formal implications, but also the organizational ones. Um, so I guess my question from that is like, do you find that um, you were getting a different reaction from, let's say, an academic audience than you are um, even your own students, right? If you present something as a paper, it's a much different reaction than if you just sort of give tutorials online and look at the viewer stats. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, the tutorials for me have worked best uh, for engaging uh, technical content where I'm in a way exposing my, my ignorance sometimes and like my way of learning through things. And in many ways, uh, the students or the, or the you know, people that kind of gravitate to like my content, uh, they tell me like that, I, that I'm approachable, that someone, you know, I, they understand how I'm kind of trying to break a, a particular problem. And, you know, there's, there's that kind of sense of like a journey through learning some technical skills. Um, obviously there is, um, the way in which I've engaged other things like theory. Uh, I recently published a book, The Architecture for the Commons. Uh, so I've, I've taken a different medium to address other issues. At some point I thought it would be interesting to do a kind of a series of videos um, engaging some of the topics of the book, but in no way, or a podcast, right? Like there's a, lots of interesting uh, formats to kind of think about how to deliver certain kind of content. Um, but in, in a way, my lectures and my writing uh, are able to kind of discuss other aspects of the work that uh, sometimes a video tutorial obviously um, cannot. Uh, although there's great practices of video essays out, out there as well, which I find uh, quite interesting. Um, and I could see how architecture will potentially embark in, in this territory as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I guess uh, just a, a couple more questions here. One is actually on the sort of verbiage and, and the sort of nomenclature that you're gravitating away from and towards. Specifically, you mentioned a move away from uh, on plethora project um, uh, and away from away from the term parametric, right, and parametricism, and right. towards something like discrete. Um, do you think that there is sort of um, uh, a gap in the amount of words that we use as architects? Um, to describe our own work or our own fields? Do we tend, tend to like categorize things together too much? Um, and are, are you, uh, can, can you just elaborate a little bit on why you're choosing to move towards something like discrete versus parametric? Right, so, so that is perhaps the central argument of my book, right? I, I'm someone that studied uh, uh, in the Architectural Association under someone like uh, Patrick Schumacher. And I was very, uh, basically at the time I was in the AA when uh, Patrick was releasing his book um, uh, and, and the series of books that came along on parametricism. So the ideas of the discrete and the ideas presented in the book um, of the architecture of the commons have been brewing for quite some time in that regard. And uh, they add themselves to kind of a, a series of not just critiques, but like a kind of a different perspective, a different approach that uh, does not agree with kind of a, an umbrella in a way that wants to kind of position all computational thinking within architecture under this, this terminology, right? And I think that discreteness, especially in its interest to kind of from a tectonic perspective and also through the, through, through the means of participation as in digital platforms, such as video games and other forms, um, it's, it's certainly at its root fundamentally dissociated from parametrics as it doesn't um, really obey to, to the same logic of a um, certain top-down articulation that you could argue uh, parametrics uh, have been able to, to master in a way. And by, by all means, I argue that yes, parametrics is a, an excellent style of choice for, for a series of 
of uh, forms of production, but it's certainly not capable to engage some of the social challenges that we see today. And I think that a far more distributed practices ought to be thought in regards to uh, how the tectonics of the building, how participation can actually uh, yield architecture that is far more uh, yeah, distributed in, in, its, in its labor. Yeah, um, you also maybe describe this as like open source architecture where, I mean, we're moving into a, a, a part of our planet's history where we, we can't really hog the good ideas anymore. You know, we, can, we need to share, I guess, uh, as it's been described, the, the patent for the bucket, you know, that we're, we're in a sinking ship and we all need to share that, that, um, that bucket. Um, how does architecture become more open source beyond just sort of academic modes of, of, of talking about it. Um, how do we start doing open source architecture, for instance? Well, that's one of the points that I discuss in the book as well. And I think that um, I see open source as one of the avenues. I do think that uh, in my own practice, I've done some open source libraries like video content, but not every project falls into that open source category because it's certainly, uh, there are challenges for funding for different interests in order to kind of get certain ideas out of the ground. So I, I certainly agree that there are many challenges to, um, and I don't think that the open source tag should be the, the silver bullet for, for what we're facing, right? Um, but there are many ways in which we could involve, we could kind of uh, create certain practice of even democracy in, in, in our platforms, right? Like how do we start envisioning software that has uh, a, a form of collective governance? Um, I think that there is the challenge that I see in open source and one of the things that I describe in the book is that uh, sometimes the, the knowledge that is being shared is, is very, it's, it's an expert form of knowledge. And, and people in the open source community have you know, uh, agreed that there's a huge gap or um, lack of documentation if you want sometimes to, in order to be able to profit from that, that sense of knowledge. So it, it certainly works among uh, certain elites of you know, people that already have that that skill set and perhaps kind of alienate someone that might kind of not have it right so uh, there's there, there's probably a series of uh, enterprises that construct a ladder that i would uh, you know it's an education ladder as a literacy ladder that takes us from you know not really being able to participate in this case of the practice of architecture or of software development for that matter um, to be able to reach that point in which there's a kind of a fluency and, and be able to to contribute and have a seat at the table. So um, I would say that any contribution, not just open source, but any contribution that kind of can expand the, diversify the audience, diversify who gets a seat at the table in terms of the, um, and be able to participate on our discipline. I think it's, it's a valuable one. Well, Jose Sanchez, thank you so much for, for answering some of my questions. I have one more question for you before you head over to your left here. Sure. Uh, and this can be completely unrelated to anything uh, that we've talked about today, but um, because we're in the midst of a, a, a pandemic and multiple crises here, I'm just asking, you know, what's keeping you happy? What's keeping you motivated nowadays? And, and what's keeping you optimistic for the, the future? Well, I'm actually, uh, I'm very grateful um, that I'm originally Chilean and the, the borders were recently open and I was able to found a little bit of, of life hacking by, by traveling to Chile and kind of visit my family and spend a bit more time with them. Even though I've been teaching online, uh, I kind of found an opportunity to kind of connect back with them. Uh, so it's been, it's been, despite all the difficulties, it's been um, uh, an interesting moment to, to reconnect to certain things, certain, you know, personal connection. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, uh, Jose, I look forward to, to watching your lecture as part of the, the lecture series here, and hopefully our, uh, our paths will cross in the future, maybe in person, <laughs> but maybe digitally again. I so. hope so. So thank, thank you, you again for joining me. My pleasure.